no, let's go back. So first of all, I'm going to give you a quick introduction of Wiseline Academy and Wiseline in general. And I'm going to talk about myself. So welcome to Wiseline. We're delighted to have you today. My name is Jakob Rampany, and I'm a software engineer, a senior software engineer in Wiseline. Let me do a quick introduction for those who haven't heard about Wiseline and Wiseline Academy before. So, um, I'm sorry, just things moved a little on my side. So Wiseline is a software development and designing services company with operations in the USA, Mexico, Vietnam, Thailand, Australia, and Spain, with six years of experience and more than a thousand employees worldwide. We started as a product company and gradually we migrated to services. We realized that we could help other high growth companies build better products faster through our different disciplines, such as technical writing, UX, project management, and all the engineering disciplines, such as site reliability, QA, AI, data, mobile, and so on. Wiseline is a trusted ally of brands such as National Geographic, Fox Networks, the Matt Washington Post. Let me show you a quick slide for the map. This is all over the place where Wiseline has a presence. And as you can see it in many, many countries. And we also have here one with all the companies we've worked with. As part of our culture, Wiseline empowers employees and the community to innovate and grow their careers. That's the reason why Wiseline Academy was created. Wiseline Academy is a platform that offers free educational programs such as workshops, talks, and certifications in today's most high value skills in technology, such as AI, software development, and today's topics, uh, blockchain, and so on. As part of our commitment to the community, we love to host awesome people who enjoy contributing to the industry. And today we have the opportunity to share our knowledge and welcome you to the first session of our Blockchain 101 workshop. So let's get started. Uh, Bernardo, the stage is all yours. I I'm going to leave you quick uh, so you can follow us all. I'm going to share it again at the end, but this is these are the links for Wiseland Academy. Okay, so be sure to follow us there. So let's get back to business. Bernardo, the stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Jacob. Uh, welcome, everyone, again, and thank you so much for joining this Wiseline Academy course. Um, as you may have seen, probably in the description, and as the name implies, its uh, purpose is to serve as an introduction to blockchain, um, how this technology works, what are the fundamental concepts, what are the main mechanisms behind this, and how they relate to each other. Um, we're going to uh, be having some theory parts, as you'll see, and afterwards, following, we'll have some practical coding uh, parts with the goal uh, to apply what we just saw in the previous concepts. Um, so next slide, please. So before we start, uh, let's introduce ourselves. Um, it's worth noting that all the members of the team have at some point worked or are currently working in a blockchain-centric project within Wiseline. So that's why we decided to design this course and share some of the knowledge that we have acquired. So um, first, my name is Bernardo Ortega. I joined uh, Wiseline on late 2019 as a software engineer. Uh, currently, I'm an associate engineer manager as well. I have more than four years of experience working in both backend and frontend development. Next slide, please. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> my name is David Praga, and I'm also a software engineer here in Wiseline. Uh, I joined almost one year and a half at the late of uh, 2019. And pretty much all uh, my projects are related to blockchain. So hope you can find a useful discourse. Uh, I have more than four years of experience working in uh, software development, specifically for uh, developing backend application and a little bit of DevOps. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Esteban. Uh, I've been here at Wiseline for a year and a half also. 
So I'm a full stack developer. Uh, I'm mainly focused on front development right now. And welcome to the course. Hi everyone, my name is Moises. I, I have been at WiseLine for almost two years. Um, I have experience as a software developer in backend mostly. Um, and welcome to the academy. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Neme. I'm also a software engineer here at WiseLine. I have a bit more than two years of experience, uh, almost a year working on a blockchain centric project. And I mainly do backend programming, a little bit of front end, and I also have some background on competitive programming. Hi everyone, I'm Victor Garcia. I'm senior software engineer at Waste9. I have more than between six and seven years of software development. I've been working on backing and some security stuff. And I've been working, I think, for the last 18 months on blockchain and cryptocurrency projects. Good luck with the So uh, I already mentioned, my name is Jaco Rempening. I'm also a software engineer who joined WiseLine around a year and a half ago. And I've been, I'm one of the older ones. I've been working on software development for more than 10 years and uh, working on a blockchain centric project. Okay, so uh, before continuing, uh, let's just talk about the workshop rules or recommendations. Uh, first of all, please turn off your phone if possible, or at least uh, try to avoid any distractions. We'll be covering plenty of topics and um, what one to the other will be, um, you'll depend on the, on the previous one for the next one. So it's recommended uh, to be as immersed as possible. Uh, Please mute your microphone as well, uh, unless we're in the question session um, that I'll talk about a little later. Um, as we go with the topics, you can ask questions in the chat. Uh, some of, or any member of the team who is not currently talking can answer the question. But um, after every section, uh, as you'll see, we have three divisions in the content. We'll have five minutes for any blocking questions, uh, anything, any concept that you think you didn't quite get and that may prevent you from uh, progressing to the next one, we can discuss that. But the idea is that after the presentation, uh, we will have a 20 minutes Q&A session uh, where we can discuss these questions much more thoroughly and we can have a, a nice debate if you have any, um, any other ideas. So next slide, please. This is the agenda of the course. Uh, let's just go through it uh, quickly because uh, as you'll see, they are grouped uh, depending on the topics. We'll be looking at the blockchain basics, what are blocks, how is the chain formed, and what are the nodes that comprise this blockchain. Afterwards, we'll be looking at transactions, which are a very important part of uh, how the blockchain works. Also about digital signatures, which are essential uh, for the control of these transactions. And finally, a couple of more abstract concepts, such as block mining, what are wallets, and followed by the Q&A session. And before starting, as I mentioned, we'll have some practical parts. And the idea of these, apart from applying the concepts, is that at the end, we have a very simplified but functional example of the main um, functions or the main uh, functionality of a blockchain so that you can have a clearer idea. Um, next slide, please. So uh, with that being said, I'll leave you with uh, Esteban, who will talk about the fundamental concepts of a blockchain. Thank you, Bernardo. So let's start with asking the question of what is blockchain? So, can, so a simple and technical the description would be saying that it is a data structure that holds uh, historical transactional records and it ensures security and transparency. But we can see it as a database database that holds uh, transactional data, uh, as simple as that. And, when, and with transactional data, I mean not only uh, currency like uh, data, like sending money or sending Bitcoin, it could be information 
So its main purpose is to have a, a track of, of this history across the time. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as you know, uh, blockchain is composed by blocks. It's what its name says, but what is a block? So a block is the fundamental part of the blockchain. Uh, its main purpose is to hold information. So it holds information about the transactions that has been made across the time in the, uh, of existence of the blockchain, but also holds information about the block itself, such as the timestamps, which is when this, the, the, this block was created. So, uh, we will cover more about the block creation later, but yeah, uh, also the blocks are identified by a hash, which is uh, unique and also by a height and the height is basically how deep the block is in the blockchain. Uh, the deeper the the, in the blockchain, the more recent this data is. So uh, in this blockchain, each one of the blocks is related by each other by this hash. So can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, as I mentioned, each one of the blocks is linked to each other by the hash. This hash is calculated accordingly to the information that the block contains. So uh, this, can, this can be the transactional data, the time it was created. So this is to create uh, a unique string, a unique, uh, a unique uh, key yeah, to identify uh, a block. So this, do this doesn't repeat. So if the information is, it changes inside the block, so will the hash of the, of the block. So, since I mentioned that the, each one of the blocks is related to each other by the hash of the previous block, well, here we have an example. So here we have three blocks, one, two, and three. And the block three is related to the number two by its hash, and the number two is related to the number one by its hash. And the number one, as you can see, since it doesn't have a previous block, it, it is called the Genesis block, which is the first block in the, in the blockchain. Uh, this have a, a dummy previous hash, uh, so because it, it doesn't point to anything. So uh, according to, to in, or, in order to, to maintain consistency, for example, if we change the, the value of the transactions or anything, any data inside the, the block of the, in the block number two, the hash will change, right? So instead of being 6BQ1, it will be a completely another uh, thing. So the block number three will not know uh, who to refer to because the hash uh, 6BQ1 doesn't exist anymore. So the blockchain will lose consistency. Uh, it will lose sense. Also, another thing that is important about blockchain is that it is a decentralized ledger. What does that mean? We will, we will cover more that, about that later, but what it means is that no one holds authority over the, the network. Uh, and by that, uh, it means that there is not a single person that, that decides what goes in and how it goes in inside uh, the blockchain. So can we go to the next slide, please? So yeah, to make this simpler, uh, we made an analogy. So basically, this is a book. So we want to add a new page inside the book. So we have a, a, a couple of editors that basically made the consensus to decide whether this page is added or not inside the book. So they together make a decision. For example, in this example, they say, yeah, this page that can be added to this book. So once they make a consensus, it is added to the book. So if, if the editors decide that, um, or, or at least the majority decide that it doesn't have to be inside the book, well, it is not added. So in this same way works the, the, the blockchain. So in this case, the book would be the blockchain, the page would be the, the blocks, uh, the, the editors would be the notes. We will talk more of this in the next slide, please. So the nodes are basically the participants inside the, the blockchain. So these are the ones that, as I mentioned, they make a consensus of, of whether the new information should be added or, or not inside the, the, the blockchain. These are the ones that uh, receive the messages. So uh, the messages could be new transactions and they emit 
the this new information through 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 the whole blockchain. And once this message is emitted, I mean this new transaction, they decide uh, whether this information is consistent or not, and if they if it should be added or not inside the blockchain. So each one of the of the nodes are connected through each other uh, using a peer to peer um, protocol. So there's no central hub. Uh, no, there's not a single node that can take uh, arbitrarily the, the whole decisions of inside the blockchain. So each one of these holds a, a copy of the whole blockchain. This helps them decide whether the new information makes sense or not for the for the rest of the of the blockchain. So can we go to the next slide? So in a summary, we can say that blockchain is a decentralized uh, database basically no one holds authority over the whole network it is a peer-to-peer -peer network as we can as we met, just mentioned uh, each one of the nodes are connected each one can emit and can receive uh, messages they can vote uh, whether uh, a new transaction should be added or not inside the blockchain and also it is immutable this has to do uh, that it is hard to 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 change the information of, of the of the blocks, it, it, it would lose sense if, if we try to do that. So the information inside the blockchain cannot be changed. Next slide, please. So I'll leave you with a bit, which will help us through uh, showing us an example of how blockchain works through code. Okay, so this is a bit once again. Uh, let me share my screen just we can start coding a little bit. Um, wait a second. Okay. So uh, let's get started. Um, I want to introduce you how we are going to um, we are going to start developing this uh, practical course. Uh, we will split this uh, practical um, exercise into three parts. Sorry, David. To... Sorry, can you make your font larger, please? Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder. Is that okay? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, cool. So, uh, as I was mentioning, we will split this course into three parts as the theory goes forward. Uh, let's start first with the previous concept of, that we have seen before. That is, for example, how a, uh, a block is created, uh, what are the main properties of a block that a block has, uh, and a, a uh, another a file that we will be uh, creating for uh, setting up pretty much all the configuration for our blockchain application. Uh, let me just, uh, this is a very small application building JavaScript, so uh, we are not using any hard thing to understand, just plain JavaScript. And we are using Node.js to just install some dependencies for our application to run, right? So uh, having said that, let's begin with uh, the course. Uh, if you see, we have uh, two files so far. Uh, this file will describe pretty much how a block will look like for our application. And uh, as Esteban was mentioning, we will be starting describing the main properties for a block. So you see we have a timestamp. Uh, this is just to unidentify, a unique identify for, for this block, right? And we will have a second property for holding the transaction. Remember that a block can have transaction. And for example, in, in talking about blockchain specifically, uh, blocks not only can have transaction, but for example, it can have any type of data that you want to process within the blockchain. There are some examples that, for example, manage uh, official documents for make sure that they are uh, authentic. And there are lots of examples that it is not are not related just to cryptocurrencies, right? So for this example, we are just using uh, some coins to store in here, some transactions, transferring some coins. And uh, we will have another property that is the previous hash, as Stevan was mentioning. Every block is chained together with the previous one so that we can make sure that we have that chain pattern, right? And uh, let's add a third property, a fourth property. This is the nonce. And we are going to 
uh, explain later what's the purpose of of this property. For now, let's define it as an integer uh, with zero value as the default. And we are going to use another property. We're going to create another property called the hash. And for now, we are going to set an empty string for it, right? Uh, if you can see, we have uh, one method in here and let's start coding it. Remember that each block needs to have a hash representation. A, a hash is, is nothing more than a string representation passing some input data. In this case, we are gonna pass the properties of a block to the um, hash function. And for the hash function algorithm, we are gonna use the SHA-256 algorithm. And this is just to generate the hash, right? So let's start uh, creating our hash for this block. And what we're going to do is say, call the function chat 256 And we are going to start, to start passing, for example, the timestamp. And we are going to concatenate pretty much every property of a block. We are going to say this dot uh, transaction. But as this is an array, sorry, I just missed here. This is an empty array. And uh, oh, sorry. we are going to, as this is an array, we are going to JSON stringify this way so that it converts into an string and we can just concatenate with other strings, right? And we are going to say uh, this dot. Uh, previous hash, and we are going to concatenate these dot nonce. Uh, now that we are using the nonce property, uh, we are going to touch in depth how this is used. But for now, this nonce will give will give us the opportunity to start generating a different hash every time that we attempt to mine a block. Uh, when it comes to mining blocks, remember that. Uh, we need to start calculating a hash for the block that is going to be added to the chain. So no, don't worry. We are going to show you how this this works uh, in further lessons. But for now, this is the the variable that will let let us generate a different hash for the for the given block, right? So okay, that's it for the block file. Uh, let's go. Let's jump to the blockchain file. And in here, we are going to pretty much. Uh, say how our application is going to behave. So let's start defining some properties. Uh, we're gonna, we are, I'm gonna create the property called chain. And obviously, as you may know, this is blockchain. We will need a way to store every block that is added to the chain. So for that, we are gonna store those blocks in this property. And obviously this is an array. For that, uh, for now, I'm just creating this as an empty array. And I'm going to create another property in here that is difficulty. And for blockchains that uh, use something called, uh, well, for the consensus protocol, uh, maybe we are going to see this in for the lessons. Uh, for this example, we are simulating a blockchain that uses proof of work. Uh, for example, in the case of Bitcoin that uses proof of work, it means that for every block that needs to be added to the chain, some miners or computers that are in the peer-to-peer -peer network needs to find or to solve a mathematical problem. And the one who solves that mathematical problem is the one that has the rights to add the given block into the, into the chain, right? So this variable in here will uh, help us to, the, to set the difficulty for mining a block. You will see later how this works in action. But for now, let's have this in mind. We are going to create a third property called pending transactions. And as uh, every transaction before it can be submitted to the blockchain needs to be evaluated before, right? So what's evaluated in the process? We need to evaluate that, for example, transaction holds valid information that is a, a valid recipient and a valid uh, sender, right? And obviously, for example, validating that funds uh, are enough to send, depending on the, the, the people who is sending the coins. And uh, in real world, uh, this is a very much complex property because it is involved a lot in there. 
But for now, let's just define this array that will hold every transaction that we want to add to the blockchain. And we are going to add a very, very simple validation, whether the transaction is valid or not, they can be added to the chain, right? And finally, we are gonna create a fourth property called mining reward. And this is, yeah, mining reward. And uh, for the consensus protocol, that is when a, a node mines uh, a block and it can be added to the chain, the, the computer or the node that wins or solves this mathematical problem receives a reward for the work, right? So for this example, we are gonna say that, sorry, this is not an empty array. This is just a number. And we are gonna say that uh, the node that is capable to mine a certain block will receive uh, 100 coins as the reward for, for mining, right? So here uh, you can see the, the concept of the mining in blockchain, right? You, for example, deploy a node with the software that can mine transactions and you receive coins for your computer to do the work, right? So that's the idea behind um, uh, mining. And uh, if you see below, we have two more methods, create a Genesis block, as Esteban mentioned. Uh, the first block added to the chain is called the Genesis block. So let's uh, implement this function. And what we are going to do here is just create a block class that is from the block file. And we are gonna say new block and we are gonna pass the timestamp for JavaScript. We use the date.now function. It returns the, the Unix timestamp. And we are gonna pass an empty transactions array. As this is the first block in the chain, we don't have any transactions coming through the network, right? So we just set an empty array. And for the previous hash, uh, here we set an empty string because you know this is the first block. There are no previous uh, blocks behind it. So that's it. We have our Genesis block created and let's go back to the constructor. And for this, let's create the empty array, but this time let's use the, the function that we created. And that's it. Once we initialize this blockchain class, we will have our Genesis block created right at the instance moment. And let's code the last method for that. In blockchain, it's very useful to know which is the latest block in the chain. That is called the height, the height, as Esteban mentioned. So let's return the last item on our uh, chain variable. And for that, we are gonna use the last index on this property, right? And yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, we are gonna continue with the theory. Uh, this is the way that we are going to work. Once we cover more concepts, we go back to the practical lessons so we can see those in action, right? So uh, I think I leave you guys with Esteban, right? Yes. There you go. Okay, so now we will continue with the transactions of the blockchain, how they work. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, next one, please. So basically, as we mentioned, the blocks contains transactional information. So they can have multiple transactions inside of them. So a single transaction is uh, basically a small unit of uh, a public record. So this public record could be an exchange of currency, but not necessarily. It could mean like an exchange of information, a signature or, or something else. So uh, as, as I mentioned before, if you try to change information of a block, it will change the hash of the block. But it, this also applies for the for the transactions because each one of the transactions has a hash, and also has information related to the persons who sends the the transaction and who receives it. 
and also information like the amount of and this example is, for example, an exchange, uh, an exchange of currency. So it says the amount of currency sent, and also the timestamp, which refers to the time the the transaction was created. So can we go to the next slide? So so digital signing. This is for sending transactions. So we can think of this like uh, when you create an account in a bank. So for that, you need an account. So, uh, so to, to start uh, sending transactions, you need an account. So for this, you you need, in blockchain, you need two things, uh, the public key and the private key. These are mathematically generated. This could, uh, in, in a bank, it, it would mean uh, your account. And for example, in your plastic, you have uh, uh, a number for your card and also uh, the three numbers in the back, right? So the public key is basically the one that you could share with anyone. The one, this is the information that you could identify yourself publicly. So for example, transported to the bank, to the bank example, this, uh, you, can, you can share, your, for example, your account number or your 60 numbers of your card. So you, so you can ask for a transaction of money, right? And the private keys should be always kept secret. So, for example, the three numbers in the back or the, the date of your card. And in this example, so this allows for accountability. Uh, the point of, in blockchain is not to secure or encrypt the message itself. It, it is to secure the point of origin. So, for example, to ensure that the transactions that are sent are sent by you and no one else. So that's why you shouldn't share your private key because if someone else has, you, has your private key, they could send transactions in your name. So next slide, please. So uh, this is a graphical example. For example, you try to send a message across the, the network. So you sign uh, a message with your own key. So then, then you send it to the network so they can all verify that that message actually comes from you. So next one, please. So we will cover this part in the coding uh, example with David. Okay. Uh, so going back to our, um, our files. Uh, let's continue with uh, what Stevan was mentioning about the transaction and signing. So uh, for that, um, let's add a third method into the block um, file. So this will validate uh, the, the current transactions for this block. Uh, let's just think for a moment that, uh, this method is implemented. I'm gonna write uh, a check in here. And we are gonna use for each transaction on the block. If you see, we are using a for loop to iterate over the transactions property of the block. And for each transaction, we will need to check if that transaction is valid. So this method is not implemented yet, but uh, later we're gonna implement it, right? This, is, this will return a, a Boolean uh, value saying that is valid or not true or false. If that is not the case, we are just returning false. If everything goes well, we'll just return to right. And going back to uh, the blockchain file, we are gonna, uh, sorry, not the blockchain file. Let's add a third um, file here to describe how transactions will behave in this example. Uh, so you hit at the same goes for for transaction class. We define a constructor having uh, three properties in here. We have a from address, we have two address, and an amount. This is this is mostly the basic properties that a transaction should comply with. And obviously, uh, from address is the is the one who send who tried to send funds to at two address. This, this is the recipient or the receiver and the amount of coins that they want to transfer, right? And the same goes for the transaction. We will need to have a hash representation of this transaction object 
because we need to make sure, right, that the transaction once is added to the blockchain, uh, uh, we need a, a way to validate that this transaction hasn't been changed over time, right? So we are pretty much doing the same with the block. We are going to use the SHA-256 algorithm to create a hash representation. And we are going to pass uh, the same uh, properties that we have in the constructor. That is dot from address. We're going to concatenate the um, to address and also the amount. This dot amount. Okay, cool. And uh, let's just add a third method in here. This is for signing the transaction. As Esteban mentioned, we will need a way to identify ourselves into the blockchain. And that is the, the purpose of the key pairs. So every key pair holds obviously two, two keys. Uh, one is the public one and the other one is the private one. So for example, you can see this as an, an analogy. For example, the, the public key is your user ID in Facebook and your private uh, key is your password, right? You, sh you share your username or your user ID in Facebook with not your password, right? This is the same for blockchain. You share with others your public key so they can send you funds or recognize you within the, the network. And your password is just to authorize to send coins within the network. And you only hold that, that private key, right? So let's uh, code this sign transaction method. Uh, in here, we just receive a key pair. This is just, uh, we're using a library called Elliptic. This is for managing cryptographic functions for key pairs in JavaScript. You can just look for it on NPM and it's the whole documentation if you have any doubts. So we are using that key pair. And the first thing we are gonna do is uh, later when we start coding the mining process, we will need, we will need to ensure that um, we will need to identify whether this transaction is for a reward mining for those blocks that, for example, mine some, for those accounts, for those nodes that mine some blocks. And if that is the case, we will just set the from address to null. You will see further in action. And with return true, this is a valid transaction, right? And uh, let's just, make use of the key pair that we're receiving here. We are gonna get the, the X string representation of the key pair. You can get the, the, the key representation in any encoding you want. For now, we are gonna use the hexadecimal encoding. And we're gonna say if the X representation of the key pair that we're receiving in here is different from the address that is sent in the transaction, Obviously, we don't we don't have the permissions to sign transaction for others, right? So, for example, you create a, a transaction, and let's say that your friend was wants to to send those coins for you. That is not possible because you need a way to authenticate yourself, and your friend doesn't have your private key, right? So that way, we make sure that no one can sign transaction for others. And uh, let's just add a couple of um, properties in here, let's create a property called hash. And uh, for that, let's say this dot calculate hash. I'm gonna use the function that I just created before this one. And once we have the property hash, we are gonna create the sign, the signature for this hash. So in a few words, what we sign in here is just the, the hash representation of this block. Uh, that's the way that cryptographic function works. So let's say, uh, let's create a, a variable called sign and let's return, let's use the key pair. There is a key pair and we are gonna use a method called sign. Obviously this is going to sign the transaction hash for us. And let's call, let's copy this in here. We are gonna sign the, the hash of this transaction. And we are gonna pass a second parameter that is the encoding that we're gonna use for having, for creating the, 
the signature, right? There are as well lots of encoding. For this example, we are going to use base 64. And once we have the signature, we are going to use another method uh, to just create the signature uh, property in here. Let's call it dot signature. And this signature will hold this property in here will hold the signature that we just created before, but in another format, right? Sorry, is sign dot to there. This is another um, encoding that we use to represent the signature. And sorry, this is in may use to there. In, in here, we're gonna use the X, X, the X encoding once again. This is pretty much a uh, standard in pretty much all blockchains out there. They, they represent the signature in X encoding. And obviously you can, for example, verify if the given signature corresponds to any public key. We are going to do that uh, in further lessons. And once we have the signature, let's just print, print it out. And uh, that's it for our transaction class. And I think we can continue with the theory. Uh, let's do a very quickly recap what we do. We create the transaction class. We obviously add a hash represent a method to calculate the hash representation for this trans for this transaction class. And we add a signed transaction method, which will receive a key pair. Obviously, this, this key pair will need to match to the from address so that we just make sure that the person who sends the coins is the same that wants to sign the transaction or in other words, to authorize this transaction. We create the, the signature property for the transaction class. And obviously we send the transaction, we sign the hash with, uh, with this transaction object. And that's pretty much it. Let's continue with the theory. Um Sorry to interrupt you there, David. Before we continue, um, just to open a small, very small space for any blocking questions. Now that we're passing into the last block of theory, I know we've been covering a lot of uh, topics. And as someone just asked in the channel, uh, well, in the chat, sorry, we've already shared the repo, but uh, we'll, we can share the link again. I know we can be going a little bit fast uh, because of time constraints, but um, the idea is that you just follow along with us right now. And if it's too fast, you can revisit the code. But is everything good so far? Uh, anyone has something in which they are lost that they would like to clarify? Uh, yeah, I just saw the question that Jill posted on the chat. Uh, yeah, just for keeping things as easily as possible, we just manage one uh, address per wallet. But for example, in more complex uh, examples, uh, we certainly can have uh, multiple uh, key pairs that can manage some funds, or in this case, to have a centralized wallet to manage some funds. But for this uh, example, let's just think, or let's just use a one key pair just to keep things as easy as possible. But yeah, that's possible. That's a good question indeed. Awesome. And Jose just shared the repo again in the chat. So if anyone was missing it, you can look at it right there. So just, sorry, oh. sorry, Bernardo. Just want there. to add uh, something really quick. Don't think as all the coding we're doing as a specific coin or for a specific technology. This is more of an abstraction. It, it has a lot, a huge amount of weak points. So this should in any way be used as a production environment of any kind. But it is more to illustrate how these basic uh, theoretical parts of a blockchain work together in a more practical way in the code. So. It was just a, a quick note. And anyway, don't try to look for what is from any other blockchain. It's just to illustrate in a more practical way this. 
Exactly. And as part of that, as we even mentioned, not all transactions in a blockchain are, are even asset transfers. Uh, we're doing that example because it's like the most day-to-day uh, -day one or the most familiar to most people. But yeah, it's just a way for us to illustrate it. And Luis is asking, should we be coding alone? Along? Uh, no, it's what I'm saying. I mean, if you want to, you're welcome to do it. Uh, but if we're going too fast, uh, don't feel like you're falling behind. Uh, we'll, in the repo, you'll see the final version with all the code. So if you uh, start lagging behind, you won't miss anything. You can have the complete code in there. And well, maybe for time constraints, we can continue uh, answering the, the questions in the chat, but I think we can continue with the theory. So as you can see, we're missing the block mining wallets and, and that's it. So I'll leave you with Neme. Okay, thank you, Arnardo. Could you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about two other concepts that are basics to the blockchain technologies, which are mining and consensus. Okay, so let's talk about mining. Uh, as we seen before, there's a, a collection of transactions that are expected to be added to the blockchain. In the coding example, this was a variable called pending transactions. So nodes have to take transactions for that uh, pool of transactions and verify them. Uh, that's the way uh, that's like blocks are mined. This is different from coins to coins, uh, but the most common example is proof of work. This is used by Bitcoin. So in this process, uh, the miner, you know, has to hash that new block and is hashing over and over again until it uh, complies with a uh, arbitrary constraint. Uh, this constraint is just used to make it harder to, to get a valid block. So once the first miner gets this hash, it can be sent to the blockchain and this node is rewarded. So miners are uh, indeed getting paid for the work as auditors. And in this process, also new coins are generated. That's the reason we call this uh, mining. We are creating uh, some new coins one, every time we mine a new block. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, once a block is mined, a, a number of nodes have to agree that this block is correct. Uh, this is what we call consensus. And we do this because we don't rely on a single entity. Our trust is not put on a single node. Uh, and instead of that, we have to rely on a part of the whole network. So. It is only until a number of nodes agree that a block is valid that we can include it to the chain. Next slide, please. Yeah. So in this diagram, you can see uh, the whole transaction process. It starts when we create, create a transaction and sign it. So for example, let's say that Alice wants to send both some coin, uh, 100 coin. Uh, Alice has to create a transaction and she has to sign that transaction using, using his, her private key. Uh, after that, the, that the transaction gets submitted and some node uh, mines a new block, including this new transaction. After that, uh, we can send that block. We broadcast this block to some of the other nodes. And these nodes have to verify uh, that block's content. Uh, this is the consensus process. Once that uh, those nodes reach consensus, we can be sure that this block is valid. So until that, uh, we produce new coins, which are rewarded uh, to the miners. And after that, uh, this new block is added to the blockchain and distributed to the whole chain. And this is the last step for transaction. And once that's done, we can say that this transaction is confirmed. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? 
Yeah, so this last, last topic is wallets. Next slide, please. Yeah, so a wallet is a secure place to store and access your private keys, which are used for address generation and signing transactions. Uh, maybe a better analogy rather than wallet is a keychain or a checkbook because the coins are not stored in the wallet. Uh, you, you use the wallet to sign transactions. So similar to a checkbook, you write checks using your signatures and you use that to send funds. If you lost your wallet, I'm talking about a blockchain wallet, you should be able to recover all your funds if you have the, the keys associated to it. And um, yeah, if someone sends your cryptocurrency, it means it is assigned to the address of your blockchain wallet, recorded in a distributed layer, not the wallet itself. Next slide, please. And talking about privacy and security, uh, the blockchain technology has some advantages uh, advantages about this. Uh, some of them are that they do not require personal data to be provided. They will just rely on hashes and keys. And another party has to store your sensible information. So in case you don't want to share any of it, you shouldn't have to. Information stored in blockchain is considered immutable. Once it is recorded, it cannot be changed. Uh, to change the state of a blockchain, you have to create new blocks and not that whole history of transformations get stored. So that make is, makes it more secure. And finally, decentralization, decentralization enhances availability and removes single points of failure. So even if in a given network there are some malicious entities, they won't be able to do something bad by themselves because of the mechanisms that we talked about before, such as consensus. This makes the uh, blockchain technology uh, more secure and reliable. I think we can go back to the coming time. Yeah, thank you, Nemi. Uh, let me just share my screen once again. Okay, cool. So, yeah, now that we have seen how uh, a consensus uh, process is made of, let's just try to reproduce it into our practical example. So uh, let's do a quick recap. So we now we have the block file, blockchain file, transaction, and we will add, add a fourth one called wallet. This is for mapping what we just saw in theory regarding wallets. And uh, let's uh, go back to our block file. And uh, we're gonna add a forward method that is called the mine block. And for this method, uh, remember that the consensus process needs to, uh, in, a way, in a way, solve a mathematical problem. So for that, what I'm going to do is just use the brute force. Uh, this is uh, certainly some blockchains use this protocol. Most of them are the proof of work. And this is just trying to recreate in a hash, obviously changing one particularly data on the hash function. Remember that we have the nonce property. So this nonce property will help us to create a different hash each time that we attempt to create one during the consensus process, right? So why we have to create uh, a new hash every time? Remember the property that we have in the blockchain class called uh, difficulty. So for example, in proof of work blockchains, what we will need to do is attempt to create a new hash. Let's start coding. I'm gonna say is dot hash. And I'm gonna pick and a slice of this string. We are gonna use the substring function in JavaScript. And I'm gonna pick the from the zero index to the difficulty property that we have in, in the blockchain. So as you, as, you can, as you can see, we receive the difficulty property in here. So we use that to cut the string out. And 
what we are going to do with that string is we are gonna uh, compare and we and here I'm gonna use uh, a function in JavaScript the, with the array class, and I'm gonna say at the array I'm gonna create an array with length of difficulty plus one, and once I have created this array I'm gonna join I'm gonna use the join function. What this is going to do is create an array with this length, and then convert every this array into and a string containing the number of zeros, which I give in this uh, pro as this property here, right? So for example, if we pass the difficulty as three, we will receive uh, a number four in here. And what, what we have as an output, we will have a string with three zeros. And remember the difficulty is to set the difficulty of the blockchain, but why we need to set that difficulty? Remember the mathematical problem that we need to solve for adding some blocks in the consensus process. So for example, in blockchain, I think we need to create a hash that has, I think 11 zeros at the beginning. So as you can see at the first attempt we do, it's most it's likely impossible to have this result, right? So miners need to have very, need to have a powerful resources to compute these kind of problems. So that is uh, that is the the idea to to mining, right? Because computers are trying so hard to find uh, those hashes that meet the difficulty. In this case, having a, a hash or finding a hash that will meet three zeros at the beginning, right? This is very simple difficulty for uh, for keep examples easy. But as I mentioned, for Bitcoin, uh, I think there is. 11 zeros before each hash. So you can imagine the incredible amount of power that we need to mine those kind of hashes, right? And obviously the, the, the node that is um, able to find this or to solve this problem is the one who claims the reward and can add the, the next chain, the next uh, node into the chain, right? So for now, uh, we are going to use the nonce property here, and each time we attempt to create a new hash, we are going to increase the nonce. And if you remember, we initialize the nonce to zero because every attempt we are going to increase this property, right? And once we increase this property, this will let us to create a different hash. If you remember, we are passing it in here, and if we change any data on here, we are going to get a different output hash from this algorithm function. So once we increase the hash, we are gonna say this dot hash, and we are gonna recalculate the hash using our function from above. So this one over here. So we increase the hash the first iteration, we create another hash if this is not meeting the criteria that we want to find the hash, right? So uh, that's it for creating for mining. Let's just add a couple of console logs just to at the end that we can run this application, we can see pretty much what's happening, what's happening behind sense, right? We're gonna log the nonce at which we find the hash that meets that, that criteria and the hash itself. So uh, let's go back to the blockchain file. And for this, I'm gonna add four methods in here. Uh, we can have pretty much uh, some validations in here that don't matter too much, but let's create a method that will let, let us add a transaction, right? So we receive the transaction object. And this is obviously as a part of the consensus process, right? To form some blocks with, with transaction. So before we can add a transaction to, to the blockchain or to a block, uh, we need to validate the from address and the to address, right? So every transaction, as I mentioned before, needs to have uh, a valid from address and a valid to address. If that is not the case, we cannot add this transaction to the chain. And we are gonna validate, we are gonna use this method that we are gonna uh, create later in here. But for now, we are gonna use this method to ensure that each transaction is valid, right? If that is not valid, obviously we're gonna throw an error. And 
the last thing we're gonna do is if all these checks are passing in here, we're gonna say that the transaction is valid. And for that, what we are gonna do is use the pending transactions array. This dot pending transaction equal to, sorry, dot push and the transaction that we are receiving in here, right? So we use transaction. And uh, according to this comment, uh, the mempool is the same as pending transactions, right? So mempool is fairly the standard name in blockchain to name these pending transactions. So in these places where miners start picking the transactions as they come in, right? So one way uh, miners uh, can start filtering out transactions is according to one property called the fee. When you send a transaction in the blockchain, you need to specify some sort of attacks for using the blockchain and that is called the fee. And every transaction that you send through the network needs to have this property, the fee, and validators are taking those transactions that have the higher fees. So the, the higher fees you specify in your transactions, the more likely a node, a validator node, pick your transactions to be processed, right? So there are cases, for example, in blockchain that if you specify a very minimum a fee, your transaction can uh, lay on this property and this main pool for days until a, until a, a, a main uh, a node can start considering your transactions to be processed, right? So this is a very important thing to remember uh, the fees for each transaction. And let's add another method. This is my independent transaction. As I told you, this transaction needs to pass through a process for validate them, validated them. But first of all, let's just create a variable in here that is going to point to the latest block in the chain. Remember that before we can add transactions to a block and afterwards we add that block into the chain, we need to chain together the new block to the latest one. So what we are gonna do in here is just, I'm gonna just copy some code just to speed up things up. And uh, what I'm gonna do in here is just created getting the last block in the chain using the, the the utils that we have defined above. And uh, then we're gonna create a new block, passing the timestamp. We are gonna pass the pending transaction because these transactions are the ones that needs to be included in this new block. And if you see, we make use of the hash of the previous block. Remember that the third property in here is the previous hash. So we point to the previous hash in this block. And once this is, uh, once we have the, the block variable created, we are gonna say block dot uh, mine block. This is the function that we uh, created a couple of minutes ago, this one. And we're gonna pass the difficulty, this dot uh, difficulty. And uh, okay, once we have mine dot block, we are gonna push the block in, in the chain. We are going to say that this block was mined successfully. And once we have mined this block, we can add it to the chain, right? And there, remember that once we once a validator mines a block, it receives a, a reward. So remember that uh, after we mine a block, what we are going to do is uh, add a new reward transaction to the pending transaction. So once we mine pretty much all transactions that users send to the network, the first transaction of the next block will be a reward for the block, for the, the validator that uh, actually mined the last block, right? So that's it. We have our mine pending transaction. And this, these two methods in here are just like very util. So uh, we are gonna, for getting a balance, the balance is the amount of coins that you have in the given address. So what we are gonna do here is iterate over each block in the chain and then for each transaction on the current block. And we are gonna say that if, if transaction, sorry. Uh, oh, I lose my cursor. Yeah, 
if transaction dot from address is different from uh, the address that we receive in this method. This is the address to know the balance of. So, so if from address is equal to the address that we want to know, that is that we send coins out, right? So we're gonna say the balance property that we have above, we're gonna say balance equals minus one and the amount, right? Because if the address, the given address is on the from property, this means that we that, that address sent coins to another person. If that is the case where this transaction dot to address is equal to the address, it means that we receive coins from this um, from this transaction, right? So what we're gonna say here is just add the amount to the balance. And at the end, what we are gonna do is just uh, return the balance, right? And we have added the last method in this class just to validate that pretty much our, our blockchain uh, object will be validated by these functions. So if you see, we, we are iterating over each block in the, in, the, in the chain, and we are gonna get the current block and the previous block. And this is going to do three validations in here. We are gonna check if all transactions in the block are valid. And how we do that is just saying they has valid transactions from the block. Remember that we have coded that method in here. And uh, we are gonna add a third validation in here to check if the current block hash is valid. And for that, we are going to say the current block dot hash is different from and again, we are gonna recalculate the hash because this function is gonna give us the current hash state of this block, right? If we casually change some data in here, this is going to be different from the actual hash, right? So that way we make sure that, or we realize that someone else changed that time to the, into the block, right? So obviously if that happens, the chain is not valid because something bad happened something did intentionally this change and obviously this is considered invalid uh, if that is the case return false if not we're going to add a third validation that is to check the previous hash remember that if we change uh, the data of any block its hash will be recalculated so the blocks that were chained together back with it will invalidate the previous hash right so if you see, we take the previous hash block, we recalculate the hash, and with the current block, we get the previous hash um, property. And if someone someone changed data between those blocks, we will know with this validation, right? Because obviously our calculate hash function will uh, throw a different output if some change, if some data change. And uh, finally, let's go back to our transaction file and let's add. Uh, a co the last method here to check the, if the transaction is valid or not. And for that, we're gonna use a different method from the keeper. Sorry, not the keeper, but we are using another library representing the keepers. That is the elliptic one. And we're gonna say, we're gonna obtain the public key from the address of the transaction, right? In an, ex in an hexadecimal format. So using this method in here, getting the public key. Once we have the public key, uh, we are gonna verify. And what we are gonna verify in here is the hash for this transaction corresponds to the, to the signature that we have here. And so this needs to be in here. Right, so this way we ensure that uh, the given address actually signed the transaction, right? This verify method will take the hash of this transaction and the, sign the actual signature of, of the, the transaction. And this method behind the scenes uses cryptographic functions to derive if the, the, given the given address was created, uh, the, the given signature was created using this address, right? And uh, finally, we're gonna create a four file 
call the wallet address. And once we have seen in theory how uh, a wallet behaves, uh, I'm gonna add two functions. That is create wallet, how to create a key pair using the lip function in JavaScript and how to validate if the given public key belongs to the private key that we are saying, right? So we go back to theory. Okay, so with that, we've covered all of the topics that we have for today. Um, so I know we've having a, we're having an interesting conversation in the chat, but now it's time uh, to ask all your questions. Um, so we're having the session right now. Um, I also, can, can we go to the next slide, please, Jacob? Uh, we're going to take advantage of this time while we discuss and we uh, answer all of your questions to put this feedback survey on screen so that you can start answering it. It helps a lot uh, to know your opinion on the course, uh, on the contents of it, how it was presented, but uh, we'll just leave it there so that you have it as a reference, but we can start taking any questions that you may have. I do have a question, if I may, guys. Thanks a lot for the session. Uh, it was great. Uh, the first question I, I it comes to my mind is, uh, you mentioned that we have a public and private key, and I cannot stop thinking of, a hey, I had a leakage of my private keys. So is there a chance, since I understand that we cannot change anything in the blockchain, is there a chance to replace that with a new private key as soon as I got it stolen, let's say, somehow? because that might represent a security breach, right? I mean, the whole mechanism, if it's not. Uh, the other one I have is, uh, I've seen in the news that sometimes there are some uh, providers, please forgive me if I, I don't say it properly, that they were offering like, uh, like virtual wallets. You had your wallets, I think, through them. And they all of a sudden disappear. So uh, is, is all of the information for those, all of the, all of the customers relying on them already lost, already gone? Or is there a way to uh, recover that? Okay, so maybe I can take on, on the first question. Um, yeah, so because of the nature of how the addresses work, and this is common for most blockchains, I've come across because it's so uh, intrinsic to how the technology works is that your private key is basically what gives you complete access to your address because even as you as we mentioned public keys are derived from your private key so these they have like a mathematically relate uh, relation that cannot be changed and therefore it's not as we put that as an example to have a more day-to-day scenario, but it's not as a password that you can just change. Most addresses in a blockchain are directly derived from your private key, and that's why you can share your public key, and that's how the rest of the network will verify, uh, as we saw, right? So if for any reason your private key gets compromised and someone has access to it, they get complete access to your funds. So the that's why it's so important, and it's uh, there's such an an emphasis on you keeping your private key safe because it's the only way you can recover those funds. If you lose that private key, you won't be able to recover them either. So this is like a double-edged sword. Uh, it gives you, and it's one of the, um, of the reasons uh, why blockchain enthusiasts uh, think it's a good um, technology to be used because you're in complete control but therefore you also have the complete responsibility to keep it safe. If you get your private key uh, exposed, the best thing to do is to just transfer those funds as fast as possible to another account that you have access and no one else has. Um, so I think that answers the first question. Is that where you were? Yes, thanks. Okay. And the second question, I think you referred to exchanges, right? All these platforms that 
help you uh, just manage your accounts and your wallets and that you've seen some cases in which they get hacked and the lot the funds are lost is that where you're yeah and i i, I think i read uh, in the news like perhaps three months back something like that that there was a broker and uh, it, it all of all of a sudden it was gone and nobody knew what happened there so i think it's more related to that yeah Okay, yeah, so when you use one of these platforms, they have a lot of benefits, of course. Uh, they help you manage your wallets and they are like a bridge for you to buy new cryptocurrencies or trade between them because for most most users uh, interacting directly with a blockchain is simply not friendly at all. So these platforms exist for this. They also give you the opportunity to store your keys for you and that's why you can get some recovery options with them but you'll also like this could be the weakest link in the security of the blockchain because in the blockchain itself you it can't be hacked or just you have like the majority of the power um or, or the presence in the blockchain is how you could maybe influence it but in big coins such as Bitcoin, Ethereum, all of those is virtually impossible to have the majority of the computing power. But in the case, so, so it's basically not, it's what we were mentioning now. It's one of the greatest things of blockchain is that information is immutable. But in the moment that you have an intermediary such as these brokers uh, having your keys, then you're trusting the security in them. So in this case, I'm not sure exactly what was the news, uh, but in those cases, what got compromised was the, the platform itself. Someone got the private keys from them or even the, in some cases, even the, the owners of the platform have made use of this. And as I mentioned, if you have the private key, you can do whatever you want with these funds. So I think it's an important distinction to make. If, if you hear this kind of, of news, it's not that the blockchain was compromised in most of the cases, it was one of these platforms. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for that. No problem. Any other questions? Something you'd like to discuss? We might have uh, uh, felt behind in the chat. So if anyone didn't get your question answered in the chat, please go ahead. If not, then I think, David, you wanted to do a last recap, right? With everything we did in the, in the practical part, maybe we have time just to close everything. Yeah, yeah that would okay. be very useful. I'm gonna show you how we, uh, this, uh, what we did, guys, uh, is in action. I'm gonna run the application. Let me just share my screen so that you can see how all these concepts are placed into a real world example. Okay. Uh, are you saying my disk code right? Yes. Yes. Uh, awesome. Cool. So uh, once we have completed the four files that we have in here, uh, I was just missing the fourth one. I'm going to explain very quickly what I did. I'm going to create uh, another method called create wallet, and I'm going to use. Uh, I want to make use of this library that I mentioned earlier, the elliptic library to create every key pair, a public and a private one. And I'm going to create another function to derive the, the public key from the private one. This is very useful in some blockchains to verify the authenticity of both key pairs of a key pair. And I'm going to return true if the given private key matches the public key, right? And once we have that in place, we can just run our example. I have prepared a very uh, to debug our application, and I'm gonna do. I'm gonna create an instance of our blockchain class. So this will uh, mine the transactions, create a transaction for us, and and all that stuff. I'm gonna use the create wallet method that we saw uh, just earlier to create wallets for my wallet and for Alice wallet, following the example that we saw that we saw on the slides. And what I'm gonna do is just uh, outputting those key pairs. And I'm gonna create the first transaction passing the public key from my wallet 
I'm going to transfer some funds to Ali's wallet using his her, her private key. And I'm going to transfer uh, this amount of coins, 60 coins. Then I'm going to sign the transaction with, the, with my wallet keeper since I'm the one who signed this transaction. Once I uh, sign that transaction, I'm going to add the transaction to the blockchain. And uh, I'm going to, after I add this transaction to the blockchain, I'm going to mine that transaction using our simple blockchain object, obviously passing my wallet publicly, right? And uh, I'm going to do the same for other two, two transactions. So in total, we will have three transactions created. Each transaction will be included into a block when we call the mine pending transaction. Remember that the consensus process is in action and every transaction that is in the pending transactions array will be included in the next block, right? And uh, I'm gonna do a, a, more, a, a couple of things below here. Uh, what I'm gonna do is just after I did the transactions, I'm gonna check for the balance, Ali, the Alice balance, and I'm gonna use the get balance address, right? So this will output how many coins they have for the given public key. And then I'm gonna call the is valid chain. This would remember that this is just to validate if everything in the in the network is okay, if no none of the blocks has been altered or modified, or even transactions. This will output true. And afterwards, I'm gonna change one data of one of the transactions. I'm gonna modify it and say that I just transferred 200 funds, 200 coins. And obviously, as I change some data, this function will output false because remember that we recalculate the hash for each transaction and for each node, and the hashes will be different, right? After I change this property, and at the end, I'm gonna just print, pre-print, and JSON format what our simple blockchain object looks like, right? So let's do uh, the debug. I'm gonna run. And as you can see, uh, let me just make, okay, we're here. So if you can see, uh, we are just opening some stuff in here. We create the wallet, uh, the my wallet public key and private key and the same for the Alice wallet, right? So uh, if you see, there are lots of, not, not lots of blocks. There are three blocks mined. We have the nonce at which we found the hash and we have the corresponding hashes of each block, right? And if you see, we are uh, mining each block. The three, the three blocks are, are being mined. And once we have uh, mined pretty much all the blocks, we output the balance of Alice. And if you can see, if you add in every amount in the transaction, you will have this number in here as the total balance for Alice. The first call to the is valid chain is outputting true, and the second one is false because we already changed some data, right? And at the end, we have pretty much the whole object. If you can see, uh, this is the, the Genesis block. It doesn't have any transaction. And for each block, if you see, we will have, uh, Remember that difficulty property that we saw? If you see every block has three zeros at the beginning, this is the first block. It has three zeros. The next one has three zeros and it's completely different. And obviously we have the reference to each one. We have to the, the first block, to the second block. It, it is referencing to this block of here, the Genesis block and so on for each one. We have the transactions and we have obviously uh, the, at the end, we have some, uh, at the end, the pending transactions arrive. Remember that we add a reward for each validator that, that solved the problem. And we have this um, transaction re reward for the last miner. And that's pretty much it. As you see, we are just implemented a very basic blockchain using JavaScript. We will uh, give you the link so you can play around with it. And I leave you with Bernardo. 
Thank you, Navid. Uh, we wanted to take the opportunity to wrap up everything. Hopefully that last example uh, helped things uh, come together, all the concepts. Uh, we're running out of time, but if anyone has the last question, we're leaving the feedback survey here. Jacob has been sharing it as well in the chat. Someone asked if we're planning to have further courses related to this. And yes, stay tuned for that. This was meant to be an introduction only. We're planning to make some courses with um, more specific topics. Someone mentioned smart contracts that could be part of it. Um, and we'll just dive in a little deeper uh, now that you have the foundations. So definitely stay tuned. Um, I don't know if anyone has any extra comments from the team, something you want to add? Just nope. thank you all guys for um, assisting to this course. So hopefully you can, you enjoy this. Awesome, thank you very much. Yeah, all resources will be shared, uh, the repo, the slides and the recording. Um, so thanks a lot for joining. Uh, Jacob, anything to add? So, no. Nothing else. Thank you everyone. Thank you thank team, you. it was great. Uh, yeah. Uh, I hope you all have a great afternoon. See you all. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.